You can put it in the chat box if you're able. Okay, um, so I'm gonna get started with the uh, land acknowledgement. Thank you so much, Shimu, for that great intro. Um, so this is from Foodshare, um, and this is uh, the most recent version. We're always updating it. So Foodshare acknowledges that the sacred land in which we operate on is situated on the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, and Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Foodshare recognizes the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here, and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land, known as Turtle Island. Foodshare recognizes and supports the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, applying both to our work. Foodshare's work is guided by principles of food justice, which includes receiving ongoing guidance from an Indigenous advisory circle on our work and on collaborations with Indigenous groups working towards Indigenous food sovereignty and increasing Indigenous food access. Foodshare also acknowledges the many people of African descent who are not settlers, but whose ancestors were forcibly displaced as part of the transatlantic slave trade brought against their will and made to work on these lands. We believe that advancing Indigenous sovereignty is deeply and inextricably linked to Black liberation, and we remain committed to advancing both. Okay, I'm also going to talk to you all about the table of contents for today. Um, so we got a lot to get through. We're going to see how much we can cram in into an hour and a half. We really wanted to give you as much as we could in this workshop because we know how important it is. Um, I just want to let you know if we don't somehow get to everything that we hope to get through today um, because of timing, you all are going to receive uh, both this recording and then also a PDF of this workshop. Um, and so you will have that information for you in at least uh, PDF form, if not uh, communicated verbally to you tonight. But our hope is that we get through it. This is our first time running it though, so we may not get through all of it. We'll just see how it goes. So we're going to do some quick intros of who, uh, who we all are and who you're talking to tonight. Um, I'm going to take you through some grounding yourself and taking care of yourself um, exercises or just thoughts to think about as we move through this topic, which can be quite difficult and activating. We're going to look at overarching factors that cause conflict. Um, we're going to go through community garden structures, formal and informal, and best practices, uh, doing some lived experience and examples of community garden and conflict resolution. And then we're going to get into some personal skill sets, collective skill sets um, for conflict resolution. And then we'll be able to get into our question and answer facilitation time. Um, and just a note about the question and answer time, um, this workshop is probably going to bring up for a lot of people very specific examples from their own life and their own experience. Um, and we're not here to um, kind of give you answers and solutions to your very, very specific um, issues. So that's not what we can offer in this workshop. We are going to have a follow-up workshop that is going to allow us to do some uh, real-world uh, example practicing of how we would move through that conflict. So we welcome your questions. Uh, just know that we probably are not going to be able to um, you know, solve or, or resolve the current conflicts you may be having or, or historic conflicts. Um, we don't have enough information or time to do that in this session. So just be thoughtful about that as we move into that question and answer. And then we'll do some announcing um, for different events that are coming up, um, including the follow-up workshop that we're going to have. Um, great. Great. Thank you, uh, Natalie. And thank you for going over the table of contents um, and telling us what to expect today. We have a wide range of people who are going to be taking um, uh, leadership on different parts of the workshop today. I'm very grateful for everything I've already seen uh, in the workshop and really excited for myself to be well grounded. Um, I find that maybe I've had conflict resolution training before, but seeing this kind of thing and being reminded again about the bravery that's required um, and all the things that are on this, I've, I'm learning so much from the speakers and facilitators. So Natalie, if you can start, start with your name, gender pronoun, uh, where you're coming to us from today, and then also what is your favorite plant to put into a garden? 
Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Natalie and I am the Community Garden and Therapy Garden Coordinator at CAMH uh, for Food Share Toronto. Um, and I've been in that role for the past four years. Um, and I've been uh, working uh, with community gardens or, you know, in the not-for-profit and education sector for over a decade. And I've done lots of um, personal work and then also some facilitation work around conflict uh, resolution and interpersonal communication skills. So I'm really excited to bring those to you in this context. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and my favorite food to grow in the garden is um, scarlet runner beans. They're so beautiful. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, Chimu, uh, you're up next. Oh, you're on mute. Hello everyone, my name is Chima and I'm the Urban Cultivation Coordinator with Greena City. I like all plants, so I don't have a favorite. And um, my pronouns are she and her. Thank you, Chima. Rhonda. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rhonda Title Payne. I'm a co-coordinator at Toronto Urban Growers. I use the pronouns she, her. And um, I've been doing urban agriculture and community food programming for 20 plus years now. Um, and over those 20 years, I do have one really big favorite plant. I love amaranth because it feeds us, us being human people, and it also feeds the birds. Amazing, and thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Angela Elzinga Cheng. My gender pronouns are she, her. I'm the executive director at Greenest City. Before that, I worked at Foodshare. Uh, and then for that, Vancouver um, in the gardens there. Uh, my favorite plant to grow, oh my goodness. My favorite plant to pick up off the side of the road if it's high enough is actually lamb's quarters. They're my favorite snack, but they never need to be planted. So I'll just say that's one of my favorite plants to see around and eat as a snack on my walks. All right, well, let's move on to the next one. Thank Great, you. thanks so much. Um, yeah, so I thought it would be just a good thing for us to go over um, thinking about where we're where we're at right now as we come into this space. So um, talking about conflict is going to be activating for us in a variety of different ways, right? So it's a loaded topic. Um, you may already feel yourself um, kind of getting activated or anticipating what might happen. Um, or thinking about past events that you're now bringing into this space. And so you may already be experiencing some anxiety in your body before we've even begun. And you may be experiencing things that are going to come up for you as you learn new skills and maybe you reflect on things in the past that, you know, have happened to you. Maybe, uh, you know, thinking about what you would have said or could have done if you'd known the skill or if somebody else could have, you know, known the skill before, whatever that might be. Um, so I would just invite us to... Um, if we want to get the most out of this workshop, um, we're going to want to keep coming back to our bodies and grounding in our bodies if we're starting to feel our brains kind of float away into the past and see ourselves get activated. Um, one thing that we can do um, as we go through this workshop is to notice if our both our feet are planted on the ground. That's always a way, that's always something that's available to us to kind of ground our energy if we're starting to feel ourselves get a little anxious or whatever that might be. Um, we can also notice our breathing. We can notice if our jaw is clenched or our body feels tight and clenched up. Those are signs that our body is having some activation. Those are signs that our body is having some feelings um, and that we may just wanna take a minute as we go through some of the, the stuff we're gonna talk about today, just to check in with our bodies. That's all this is about. Um, if you need to, you can you know, go on mute, take a break, take a walk around your room or shake it off or move around as you hear um, what we're gonna be talking about today. If, it, if it's anything that comes up that feels hard for you um, and just move the energy through your body um, just so you can get the most out of it today. So um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. And also making sure you have water. Um, earlier when I was going through my slides and I saw that, I literally went up and got myself water. So staying hydrated is also a great way for us to be able to stay present and, and uh, nurture our bodies. Simple, simple stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk uh, briefly about why conflict arises in general in the first place. So this is gonna be true in our gardens and this is gonna be true in our lives in general. Um, we're gonna talk very specifically about gardening today, but 
Um, why does conflict happen in the first place? So there's a couple of major reasons. So there's structural reasons and then there's personal reasons. So the structural reasons why conflict can happen um, is because an implicit or explicit bias is coming up. So that's in relation to um, the structures that have informed our way of thinking through our culture and through our uh, through our family, um, what we've been passed down. So that can be things like racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, ageism, colorism, classism. So all of those things that are embedded biases, a lot of us are unaware of, um, those come out in ways that we uh, either uh, are directly um, taking ownership of and we mean to do it, but a lot of the time it's coming up in ways that we are not aware of. Um, and that actually is a big source of conflict for um, lots of reasons. And it happens structurally within organizations and it also happens interpersonally between two people. Um, it's also related to the imbalance of power dynamics. So obviously the first section there of structural those are also um, related to imbalance of power often, but then there's more specific ways that we hold power aside from those overarching structures, such as if we have um, between gardeners and landowners, so there's an imbalance of power there, an imbalance of who gets to make decisions, and then also things like between established members of um, of the garden versus new members of the garden and uh, who feels entitled to what version of power and who feels entitled to have a say, whose voices are not heard and whose voices are heard. Um, all of those people um, may have very similar identities structurally in that first category. They may be of the same race, they may be of the same class, the same gender, da da da, but they're holding different varieties of power and the power is imbalanced um, in the structure that they've created and that also causes conflict. Um, there's also a big one for me in life in general is that there's a lack of clarity or consensus around the structure or the rules or responsibilities that are set up. So if you have not communicated effectively with everybody and everyone hasn't agreed, um, then that's where a lot of conflict happens. It's literally just not being able to talk to each other and not having a clear sense and a clear shared understanding and a clear shared reality of what is happening um, and what other expectations of the relationship or of um, the organization or the space that you're occupying together. So that's a big one that we're gonna talk about. And then the personal. So personal boundaries being crossed, um, whether that's stated or unstated. So a lot of us have boundaries that we, um, we uh, tell other people, you know, don't do this, don't do this, or um, I prefer this to happen, or I prefer that to happen. Um, those, are, those are our personal boundaries. A lot of us have boundaries that we don't state to people, and a lot of us have boundaries we don't even know are our boundaries. Um, so that's something that happens with conflict, um, is your personal boundaries get crossed, right? Um, one good way to know if your personal boundaries are getting crossed is if you uh, have resentment. Um, coming up. So resentment is usually a sign that uh, you've allowed someone to cross a boundary. And so now you're resenting them and you may need to actually figure out what that boundary is. But um, we can get into that later. Uh, people feeling disrespected or unseen. This is a huge part of why conflict arises as well. They're just feeling undervalued. Um, people feeling scared of losing belonging, value, or control. So often that is happening if um, you're bringing something to someone that uh, you're telling them that they've hurt you or that um, their behavior hasn't been appropriate. Um, and instead of being able to hear that, what happens is they'll double down on their behavior or, or gaslight you or make you feel like you're the problem. And that's because they're afraid of losing belonging. They're afraid of being punished. They're afraid of their value being diminished or losing control instead of recognizing that conflict can actually bring us into more belonging and having uh, more of our values expressed. Um, so it's a, there's a mismatch there, but that happens a lot. Um, unaddressed smaller issues that compound into a larger issue. This is also something that happens because we are not communicating. So we're not mm -hmm. telling people. Um, oh, yes. Sorry, I'm not sure. Um, Sorry, <laughs> maybe someone didn't mean to have their, um, their uh, audio on. Um, and then the last thing here is uh, past trauma um, or past experiences being brought to bear in the present. So there may be something very small going on, but it's triggering for you 
um, something that's attached to quite a larger thing that's happened in the past that has actually not a lot to do with the current situation. And that can be really tricky too. And that happens all the time. So those are kind of the overarching main reasons or major reasons why conflict is often happening. It's, uh, you can see here, I said, notice how none of these are really about the garden hose. Uh, I just said that to represent that a lot of times when we're dealing with a conflict we think is about the thing at hand, often actually there's all of this stuff underneath that is not being addressed. Um, that is actually the source of why that conflict is happening. It's not because the hose didn't get put back away. It's because how it made you feel, or it's because of, you know, some of the other uh, histories that you've had um, that are being brought to bear on that moment. Um, okay, now I'm going to pass it over to Chimu. Thank you very much, Natalie. So I will be speaking about uh, different community garden structures and conflict management. So um, obviously we know that everyone here is involved in gardens because of the benefits that they provide. So benefits to families, community members, and those can all improve things or include things like improved multicultural relations, food security, health and education, environmental awareness, as well as an array of social benefits that empower uh, participants. However, these same benefits can also be a locus of conflict. So things like different cultural expectations, uh, different ideas of food um, and growing. So uh, systems and structures that do clarify garden operations are necessary for sustainability and engaging the community and cultivating a robust volunteer workforce. So addressing conflict equitably and following a clearly understood procedure builds trust between the gardeners as well as reduces the risk of unfair treatment, meaning that if you have one across the board rule that everybody understands and everybody had input in, it's far easier for everybody to adhere to. So conflict management and mediation strategies help uh, gardens to promote a fair, safe and enjoyable gardening and volunteer experience. It also empowers members of the garden to be responsible for day-to-day -day operations with effective tools for management uh, structures and processes. Slide. Mm -hmm. oh. So we have formal and informal garden structures. So uh, with formal, usually in a formal structure, the rules, regulations and policies within the garden are typically written out and they're explained clearly so that all gardeners and managers uh, understand how things work. So this documentation can take um, the form of like a contract, you know, multi-page contract, also a chart that says yes to this, no to that, um, or a, just one sheet of rules. So it can come in different forms. So most formal garden structures have a hierarchical uh, structure. So usually this director or coordinator who are in charge of actually producing the document and hopefully with gardener input. However, there are also collaborative and collective structures that can also be formal and have uh, a, a non-hierarchical structure. Thank you. So with informal garden structures, in an informal garden structures, the community garden doesn't operate under the guidelines of a written or a specific written document that spells out the rules, regulations, and has a chain of command. Um, under this structure, the garden operates by a system that's developed by gardeners ba based on modalities that have been proven effective over time. So informal structures can be unique for every garden because they're based on the legacy of the garden. So, and the number of gardeners, the demographic of the gardeners, as well as collaborative techniques that were developed over the life of the garden. Slide. So in terms of formal structures for community gardens, the pros, um, the primary advantage of formal structure is that um, it clearly delineates the roles and responsibility of gardeners, partner and partner organizations. And as a result, everyone is clear about what they have to do and how they're supposed to achieve the desired outcomes. It also keeps work processes under centralized control because there's an established method of decision-making and implementation of directives. And everyone has the same information in an immutable form, meaning a contract, something that everybody can refer back to, not having to remember conversations or anything like that. Um, so it clarifies uh, processes and also proof of someone's agreement to the process is readily available. So if you had a contract, it's signed, that you can prove that somebody um, agreed to something. 
Um, the cons of this would be required staff time to produce um, materials, to have all those materials signed. So, and also resources for translation of written materials. So if you do have a multicultural, multilingual um, garden, having everything translated, um, and if people are literate, if people are not literate, then having everything verbally, um, you know, translated to them. It's also vul vulnerable to staff turnover, and there can also be a disconnect between staff and employees um, and gardeners due to differing priorities. So the informal structures for community gardens, the pros are that it does break down a hierarchy. It requires far less staff resources. And the major advantage is that it's highly adaptable to change because people can on one day decide one thing and the next day change it, um, you know, using a consensus model. And an informal structure is fluid enough that um, you can make changes quickly and efficiently. So the cons of informal are that um, we have barriers in communication and unclear rules and procedures. So if you are um, having a really informal structure for your community garden and it's based upon verbal agreements, um, if, people, if, you have a, if you have a garden where people speak um, a lot of different languages, you may, you, know, you may infer that people understood and maybe did not. Also, there are cultural differences in communicating and receiving information. And another disadvantage would be the absence of a supervisory authority that can lead to disorganization and conflict if gardeners are not adequately resourced and empowered to hold each other accountable. So the best practices in any community um, garden structure would be ant to anticipate and review potential sources of conflict before they arise and develop a procedure for dealing with different types of conflict. Number two would be cross-cultural knowledge and communication skills. And I mean, we touched on that in the previous slide, why that would be important. And then also training garden leaders to observe for signs of conflict. So things like, you know, people not necessarily saying that there is a conflict happening, uh, but things like discomfort, avoidance, tension, small misunderstandings and incidents. Um, and then number four, the community garden should develop an approach that is clear and consen consensus driven, whether it is formal or informal. And when we use this approach, conflict can be mitigated by empowered leadership and accepted rules. But there is no one size fits all. And there can also be a mix and match of different things that you do. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Is Angela? Yeah. Are you missing the one just before it? Um, I don't think so. This is it. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. It's I'm <laughs> talking about conflict. That was a nice minor conflict. <laughs> uh, so one of the pieces that um, I bring to this, and thank you, uh, Sophia, you just brought up that, you know, um, that in your experience, in the chat you wrote, in your experience trying to create formal structure created conflict. And so that's interesting. And I find, I bet you that anyone here who's part of a garden or community garden, uh, or actually who's part of life has experienced conflict. So particular conflicts have happened in gardens. And I just wanted to give some um, ex uh, experience of some of the um, conflict that has happened or that I have heard happen or witnessed happen across the city in different gardens. Uh, and, you know, if I was in a room where I could see everyone, unfortunately, I can only see like six people at a time. I'd have people raise their hands. Uh, but you can see the screen and I bet you that you've experienced all of these. So one of the ones that um, come up a lot is encroaching into other garden spaces. So if you can imagine, which I'm sure many of you can, uh, your, your garden either got stepped on while someone was taking care of um, their own garden or you're encroached. So all of a sudden you see someone's, um, their, their edge of their garden is starting to, to encroach out and it might be encroaching into your garden. And when I looked back at Natalie's examples there, that was a very good example of my personal boundaries being crossed uh, and also a very valuable resource being lost. Um, the second one, which gets brought up a lot, are stolen vegetables. Uh, I, I would, there's not one garden that I have been um, part of or interacted with uh, or supported 
that where stolen vegetables hasn't come up. Uh, and that is another very excellent, excellent um, example. And you know, I, when I was in a, part of a community garden, I waited and I waited until this gorgeous, beautiful, purple, oddly shaped tomato grew. And I looked at it one day and I'm like, one more day, one more day, it's gonna be perfect. And I came back the next day and I bet you everyone can guess, it was gone. And that vegetable had taken the, almost the entire season to grow and my family faithfully watered it. And uh, that, was, uh, that, that was so sad. And that actually is often um, people's um, experience. They're sad, they've lost something, they've put lots of energy in too, and also um, angry. Um, and Natalie can probably speak again about what uh, one of those, per what, what personally has happened to you. Often you engage in uh, conflict resolution and it doesn't work. That has absolutely happened. You've, you know, maybe you're in a good space and you've worked really hard. Uh, maybe you aren't in a great space and the conflict that you tried to resolve just ended up in a very bad way. Uh, either way, maybe um, different people have experienced it differently. They've had their own things that trigger them. Absolutely have I tried to resolve conflict and things went in a downward spiral instead of in the way that I was hoping it would go. And finally, the last one, um, one example, well, I can think of many, many examples of this, but most recently we had um, an experience in our gardens this last year uh, where someone um, said that someone shouldn't be in the garden because they were uh, too, they shouldn't, it, they were above the age. So I think they're above the age of 70. I think you weren't supposed to be in the gardens if you're above the age of 70. And when I look back at Natalie's, um, part here where she said one of the reasons that people get really angry uh, they're feeling scared of losing the sense of belonging or their value well what ended up happening is this gardener ended up advancing with her shears at the other gardener who told her she couldn't be in the garden and that other gardener fell over and um, it was quite a lot of conflict that happened as a result of that and so these are just some examples of uh conflict that's happened and I'm sure you can think of um, many other ones that's happened in gardens.